So today is uh, Halloween, a feast that originally was good. Uh, the feast of so All Hallows Eve, the eve of the Feast of All Saints, which is obviously tomorrow. So liturgically, things begin on the night before. So All Hallows Eve, that's how it came about. Strangely though, um, it has become like a, a feast of the dead, you know what I mean? As opposed to the Feast of the Saints, it's like a feast of witches and zombies and ghosts and tombstones and your know, front lawn and stuff. Very, very strange. My, uh, in my youth now, um, there was, we went trick-or-treating myself and my brother once. Uh, we went upstairs, went to my mom's makeup drawer. I got eyeshadow, green eyeshadow. I think I must have used a year's supply of my mom's year eyeshadow just on my face. Uh, so it was glistening green, the kind of glistening, kind of glittery looky thing. Uh, I thought it looked like the Hulk. So we went to our neighbors and they recognized us and we, oh, the Cattle Boys. And I thought like we were unrecognizable. I mean, I'm green. <laughs> and my brother was wearing like a, a bin line or a trash bag or something. Like, you know, how on earth did you recognize it? Okay. So we got a mandarin orange and like two nuts each or something like that and went home. So that was the end of our trick or treating career. Uh, yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a strange kind of a feast, really. The way it's celebrated now is very, very strange. Isn't it interesting? If you walk into any of these, like, pound shops or your, your little Zeraldis or that, and you can have aisles, right, of maggot-eaten zombie faces and all sorts of ghosts and all sorts of quite terrifying-looking stuff and blood leaking out of various orifices of a person's face, masks all over the place. But if you talk to children about the reality of purgatory or hell, that's considered inappropriate. Someone explain that to me. Now, it's not, obviously, we don't, we're not threatening kids with hell or anything, but... I mean, we don't seem to have, like, I mean, I've walked into a couple of houses where, you know, you're greeted at the door with a banshee, kind of, so just a skeleton head and a kind of a uh, lacy, grey, kind of a vague looking kind of body hovering there with, oh, the, the red eyes, you seen that, yeah, the glowing LED red, red eyes kind of thing. Life size, that's, that's horrific. Yeah. But it's fine. Kids, oh, I love it, I love it, like the four-year-olds. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> But you mentioned, but you mentioned purgatory or hell. I said, oh, it's, it's fairly inappropriate. I, 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 I think somehow I think actually young people are capable, children are capable of understanding these mysteries at, at least at a level appropriate to their age. Of course, we're not threatening anybody. But the, the fact that these things are real, I think kids are well capable of it. We've been speaking the last couple of days uh, about our, our reading on Thursday, which was from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter six where he says, for it is not against human enemies that we have to struggle, but against the sovereignties and the powers who originate the darkness of this world, the spiritual army of evil in the heavens. So the fact that there are real spiritual beings around us, there is a spiritual battle in court in playing out around us. We are, we are, we're on the battlefield. We're on the battlefield, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, we're on the battlefield. And I was talking to a friend of mine uh, who's a nurse there yesterday, and she had a very interesting message for me, which she, she sent. She, she works in one of those, what, do, what would you call them, like, like a, for all of you not from around here, I don't know what you call them, it's like a care doc, what's care doc called? It's like a call center, call center for doctors. I don't know what it's called, that. like an emergency, you, a place where you call, you call in if you've got an emergency at night. So you deal with the nurse first, if she can sort it out, she sorts it out. Uh, and if not, then they refer you on to the doctor. So whatever that's called in whatever part of the world you're from. Okay, so, um, and she said, very, very interestingly, if you've been watching the news recently in Ireland, which I haven't, uh, there have been all sorts of very, very tragic, not so much accidents, accidents do happen, but suicides and murders and, and just like really tragic stuff. So this is like from the perspective now of a professional, right? Uh, she, she takes calls at, uh, during the day and, and, and at night uh, from uh, people in need. So she says, look at the last past two weeks in Ireland. Three brothers killed in a murder suicide in Cork. A mother killed her eight month old and jumped off a pass over on the M50, that's the ring road around Dublin and died last week, and now a mother and her two beautiful kids found murdered in South Dublin two days ago. Spirit of suicide and murder running riot. And I blame the lack of mass being celebrated in the country. 
Every second call in work is mental health related. People need hope, they need the truth. It's time to speak up more than ever. Interesting, you know, again, this, this is like, this isn't just like religious rant from my perspective or anything. We've got a professional here who's saying that the last couple, the last couple of weeks have been very, very different. And the calls that she's getting, it's, it's people who are desperate, people who are losing hope, people who are on the brink of suicide, people who are considering overdosing. These kind of things are increasing. Now, it, it normally does increase around the winter, especially around Christmas. Around Christmas, people feel the lack of family, the lack of, of uh, unity when they see like this is supposed to be the season of good cheer and the season of, of togetherness and all that. Uh, it makes your loneliness all the more acute. So there normally is uh, an increase in the suicide rate around, around Christmas. But this early in the year, it's just very interesting. I think it's very interesting. And to be honest, I think it's very true. Again, the more we take God out of society, the more we're taking light, so uh, the light that helps us to see reality, the more we take that away, the more dark the world becomes. But then if the darkness is what we have chosen, right? This is, like, this is I don't want God interfering with my freedom. I don't want God limiting me being me and realizing my passions and all of that. So I don't want him. I don't want him. Now things get progressively darker. Now, as, as things get pro progressively darker, we actually become progr progressively more unhappy. But we have chosen this. I don't want all them rules. I don't want God. I'll invent my own faith. Yeah, but that, that's a faith of your own invention. So it doesn't bring light. It doesn't bring grace to invent your own faith. So you continue then trying to build up this world, uh, build up your happiness, try to build up your, your, your self-realization in this world of darkness. And all you discover is misery. But maybe if you just try harder, it'll work. So you, whatever you were doing, you do it more intensely. So you drink more, you socialize more, you have whatever, more Saturday night activities and all that kind of thing. And we keep getting, investing in that and wonder why we end up so miserable. But just do more of it, just try harder. And then you find yourself on a bridge, looking down the river. Like, because it just, it, it, it will, it cannot lead to happiness. It cannot lead to happiness. It won't lead to happiness. You know, where we buy into that lie so easily of the, the lives of the rich and famous. You know, that once, you know, once you have uh, uh, achieved a certain amount of success, or once you've you know, made your first million or something, somehow that you're happy. And it's just pure, solid rubbish. It really is. It really is. I mean, if you've ever gotten to know rich people, they're just like anyone else. And they've just got the same kind of problems anyone else just on a bigger scale. Instead of you know, worried about, will I lose 100 euro this week? Will I get the 100 euro bonus? They're like, will I get the 100,000 euro bonus? Same problems, just a different scale. So it just doesn't, like, once we start to exclude, excluding God from our lives, you know, things get progressively darker. I think that's a, it's a healthy way for us to see it, you know, darkness, okay? Because the way, <clears throat> the way God's presence works, People have been asking me recently about discernment and how to discern things. And a very kind of simple principle for discernment is that discernment doesn't usually happen with great big signs. Okay? Like I was talking to a, a friend of mine and he said, you know, I was, just, I was reading the Bible and the Bible mentioned uh, some, some lad who was a carpenter. So I think I'm supposed to be a carpenter. And I said, right, okay. I said, I don't think somehow the God Bible is going to ever recommend that you become an electronic engineer. Because it doesn't say it, the Bible. So it doesn't really work that way. I opened a random page, the word carpenter was on it. I'm supposed to be a carpenter. No, it doesn't, it, no, that's not the way, that's not, not the way, that's not the way responsible discernment works, okay? The way discernment works ordinarily. Okay, you've got a number of options. This is also as regards relationships, as regards careers, as regards where you should go on holidays. You've got a number of options, okay? So you look at the options, you weigh up the pros and cons. That's it, so look at the options, weigh up the pros and cons, get advice. So ask people for help, people who have been down those various avenues, roads, people who work in those areas, and get advice. And number three, decide. Now, people might say, Father, you haven't mentioned God in any of that, you big pagan. Hold on. Okay, the way work, or discernment works ordinarily, Right, is if I'm praying, so if I'm in a state of grace, so I haven't any mortal sin in my soul, 
So then I'm allowing the what's called the indwelling of the Trinity, uh, sanctifying grace, uh, to be present in my heart. Now, the presence of God in my heart will illuminate, illuminate my intellect and my will. So my intellect, so that because you know the way the, the difference between the intellect and the will, I might know what is right, I might know what is wrong, but just because I know what's wrong doesn't mean I don't do it. I may know. Right, that smoking is really bad for my head, but I like it. Do you know what I mean? So even though I know it's wrong, I do it anyway. So there are two different things, the intellect and the will. So this presence of God in me illuminates my intellect to allow me to recognize what is right and what is wrong. Just like, as I say, I've mentioned this example before, no one ever had to explain to me why an abortion was wrong. It's just plain obvious. Just, I just know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a child, therefore it, it, it's a life, it's a human being, it's got on a scientific level, it's got its own in, distinct DNA, it is not its mother, it's in its mother, but it, it I'm not saying it because it's not a person, it's a, he, she, he stroke she, uh, uh, is, is, is there uh, in their mom. So it's a distinct person, therefore it's a life, therefore it deserves all of the protection that, 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 that we can and should give it. Okay, uh, but no one ever had to explain that to me, just because if God lives in us, it's just plain obvious. It's just plain obvious. Then there's the Lord illuminating our will. The fact that I know right and wrong doesn't mean I always choose it. So the Lord's presence then in me should strengthen my will that I choose what is right. So God's will then doesn't mean that you, know, you have to go this way or I'm unhappy with you and I'll burn you. Right? A God, you have to walk through life like, like on a tightrope, and this side is, 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 is one excess, and this is the opposite excess, and you're just trying to get through life like that. That's not, how, that's, not how God, that's not how discernment works. Nor should it be the case that as soon as you get a sign of any sort, yeah, it's, it's that direction. The Lord actually wants you to decide to use the intellect he gave you, the will he gave you, allowing that to be inspired by grace, and then you decide. You decide out of love, and then, as I was saying to someone not so, not so long ago, nine out of ten choices that we make, if we discover that we're going down the wrong road, we can actually readjust. Do you know I mean? You start a job, you, you prayed about it, you discern it, you start it, then after two years, you just, you know, this is just, I'm just miserable here, I'm just surrounded by, you know, hatred or bickering or whatever it be, I can't even find it. Okay. <coughs> Apply for another job, get another job. If it's that bad, apply, just go for it, get for another job. Like, you're not, you're not married to the place, just go. Now, that's where marriage is different. Uh, so, choose wisely. Uh, but, but this is, so this is how discernment works ordinarily. It's not through big signs or through booming voices from heaven. It's through a, a regular prayer life. It's through a regular sacramental life. It's through this indwelling of God illuminating your ordinary decisions and thoughts. So I begin to understand what's right and wrong and then choose what's right, hopefully. So, okay, back to what we were saying earlier. You take the light away. We take God out of society. We take God out of our schools, hospitals, out of our families. So no prayer in the family. Now what starts to happen? Things start to get dark. Now we can't actually recognize right from wrong, we can't see really what we're doing, so we just, we do what fulfills our impulses. I want new, a new phone, a new phone, that would do it. Everyone gets, gets new phones and it makes them really happy. I saw it on the ads, they were all smiling. iPhone X, it, it X, is there an XS now or something? Uh, XR, XR, that will make me happy. Empty bank account, yes. Right, on arrives the phone, you go, it's just the same as the last one, it's got, it's got a load of cameras on the back, but it's pretty much the same as the one I had before. Shoes. I need more shoes. Okay, shoes. They're okay. Add to trolley. They're all, mm, they're all right. Add to trolley, cart, whatever it's called. Right, add to that. Empty account, yes. <laughs> All right, shoes come and go, oh, they're too small, they're too pink, they don't go with anything, I don't know. I need, what else do I need? 
I'll stay up all night and see if I can get new, more likes for my new profile picture. My goodness, like, and we just keep chasing, 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 and it's empty. This is the world we live in, like, it's just, it's, it's, it's not good out there, guys. It's not good out there. And there's a spiritual battle raging around us. So, okay. To end on a positive note on this Halloween, uh, the Lord says so clearly through St. Paul, right, that the spiritual battle that we're engaged in, it's not lost. In fact, we know the spiritual battle is already won, right? I have overcome the world, says Jesus. Fear not, for I have overcome the world. So the, world, the battle is already won. Jesus has already defeated sin and death and darkness and all of that. Je Jesus has already won. That is why you must rely on God's armour, or you will not be able to put up any resistance when the worst happens, or have enough resources to hold your ground. Put on God's armour. Put on God's armour. We live drawing from his grace. We live drawing from his love. We live drawing from, from his pierced heart. And then we lack nothing. And then we need not be afraid, no matter what happens. I mean, if we go for a second lockdown, whatever, whatever happens. Like, we don't, we'd never live in fear. As Catholics, we never live in fear. Because we have God on our side and we know that the battle is already won. So what do we do? We try to fill our hearts with as much light as we can. As much of God as we can. As much grace as we can. Regular, daily prayer life. There are confessions now over the weekend in, in Waterford Diocese. In the cathedral, I heard, so go to confession, live out of the grace of God, pray your rosary, consecrate yourself to Our Lady, go to Mass, if and where it's possible, and then we need not fear. So we ask the good Lord today, on the feast of all, on the vigil of the feast of all saints, that our same protectors in heaven, all these holy men and women, these examples of virtue, that they may lead us and guide us into becoming saints ourselves in our own day. Amen.